Thank you for watching our video made at the church at Fort Collins on Sunday morning, January 31, 2021. On that Sunday morning, Michael Leip was preaching, and the title to his sermon was The Bad Giants in My Life. He took from the five following scriptures, Matthew 7, 15 to 23, Philippians 4, 8 and 9, Romans 8, 35 through 39, Ephesians 1, 4, and Titus 2, 13. Good morning, everybody. Let us open in prayer. Father in heaven, it is an awesome thing to be part of your family. It is an awesome thing to have eternity fixed and not have to be fearful about what will happen. And Father, uh, while we still remain, you assure us all will be well. Father, uh, we uh, really grab onto that, insure, that assurance uh, in some of these crazy days like we're going through. Father, let us be a light. Have us be bold for you. Have us be about the family business and uh, sharing just how fortunate we are that a benevolent God will redeem us from uh, an eternity of separation and uh, knit us in to the most auspicious, powerful, wealthiest, brilliant, beautiful family in the universe. What an amazing thing. Father, uh, we pray for all of those who are uh, wrestling some of the same things as my wife, just uh, as our bodies begin to uh, challenge us. Father, we just pray that you would uh, be with all of them, particularly those that wrestle pain. It's just uh, a, uh, a nightmare. Father, uh, we pray for all of those that are shut in with uh, the COVID being a fearful thing. Father, we pray you give them great peace and that uh, you quickly free them. Father, we are, uh, we're thankful you gave us your word and that you have given us guidance in our lives. And Father, uh, we want to thank you as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory ever. This Amen. is Ben Patchen. Ben Patchen is going off on a great adventure, and he's here to tell us about it. Hi, everybody. A uh, long time no see for most of us, but so excited to be here and just share with you uh, what's going on in my life right now and uh, how I get to impact the kingdom this year. Um, so after I graduated high school, just this past May, I was a little at a loss for what to do. It kind of seemed like I had to step into the adult world for the first time. Didn't know if I was going to go to college or work or maybe just take a lot of naps in my parents' basement, but I knew I had to do something. So praying into it and uh, getting guidance from some of the leaders in my church, I found myself applying to the Antioch Training School, which is my church's uh, kind of like a nine-month Bible program. So I applied for that, got in, and since this September, I have been just pursuing God with all my heart, with like-minded people my age, going after Jesus. And so that brings me to this second semester of the school, where we are now fundraising for a mission trip to the Middle East. And more specifically, we're going to Dubai. 
So one of the more safe places in the Middle East for sure, but we're really excited to be able to go there um, for a few reasons. The first one is just because we believe that God loves all of those Muslims just as much as he loves people here in America. And we are so excited just to be able to love them and serve them and share the gospel with them. We also believe that God is worthy to, to give our lives to. So I am excited to just have a yes in my heart and serve God with all my soul, mind, and strength. And I believe that it's leading me to the, the Middle East for a month here this spring, starting April, we'll be flying out to the Middle East um, in which we'll partner with a local church there actually. And we will just be serving the, uh, the indigenous people who live there as well as spreading the gospel as quietly as we can. Um, the only main threat is actually to the, the people who live there um, us Westerners, it's completely fine for us to be Christians, but switching religions there is actually uh, punishable by prison time and, and fines. So um, we are just so thankful that God is giving us an opportunity to step in and have courage for those people who it's actually illegal for them to share. So I just want to say that I'm so thankful for you guys have been willing to partner with me and that Michael has been able to be in contact with me that my prayers have been answered by you guys actually just giving faithfully and uh, everything that I do will also just be a part of your guys' story and legacy now when, when we're all there worshiping God in heaven. Amen. So thank you so much. You bet. Hey, um, <clears throat> I've known this guy for quite a while now, and uh, I am so excited for how God is using him. Um, I... Ben helped us a lot over at Drake Road with the sound system and the media system over there. And, and I don't know who taught who. Did I teach him or him teach me? I'm not <laughs> sure. But we learned a lot together. We have decided to uh, partner with Ben and support him as an outreach. And I am so excited about this. I uh, got the email from him a few weeks back. And, and I came to church and Peter was already thinking about it. And I was thinking about it. And I'm just so tickled. And we want to give him this check that he can uh, give to the church in his support. And I'd like to pray over him this morning. Will you help me with that? If you feel comfortable at all and putting a hand up toward him, that would be awesome. But that's up to you. Heavenly Father, we pray over this young man first that you will use him in a powerful way. That somehow, Lord, you will speak through him and work through him to touch the people where they're going. I pray over this whole team, Father God. First, keep them safe. Keep them safe in your arms and just surrounded with your legions of angels that no harm will come to any of them. And then we pray that not only they have an impact on these people, but that these people have an impact on them as well and gives them something to think about the rest of their lives. To, to be young enough to go on these things and, and, and blessed in such a way to be able to go with this team is, is something you picked out before this young man was even born. And that's the awesome thing when your plans come to fruit. So Lord, be with them, watch over them, protect them, and bless them in a mighty way. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Ben is going to be around later to talk, uh, visit with you if you have any questions. And while you're here. doing that, if you would open to Matthew chapter 5. And this is what Matthew wrote, quoting the Lord. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, if you'll move back to Romans chapter 12. Starting at verse 14, Paul wrote, Bless those who are persecute, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, uh, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Now to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. Again, the Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink um, or in respects to festivals, the new moon, the Sabbath day, things which are mere shadows of what is to come, but are the substance that belongs to Christ. Let no one keep and defraud you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and in worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions as that he has seen, inflated without cause by the fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied is held together by the joints and the ligaments, growing with a growth which is from God. And lastly, let's turn to the Gospel of John. If I can find it. John 14. Verse 27, where John says, peace, he's quoting Christ, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor uh, let you be fearful. And so says the Word of God. Well, it's me and you today. Um, Peter and I are going to start sharing whenever there's a fifth Sunday in the month. Uh, Johnny and Rick have other obligations. So we've agreed to take on the fifth Sunday of each month. Uh, not each month, the months that it has a fifth Sunday. So um, I don't know if I drew the long or the short straw this week. We'll see. I've entitled this, The Bad Giants in My Life. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I don't want this about me. I want the words to be from you. Help us in this topic that I've chosen to speak on this morning to understand and to comprehend and to know better how to deal with this issue in the future. We invite you here, Father God, to sit by each one of us and to touch our hearts with what you would have each one of us hear. 
So Lord, direct me now as we talk about bad giants. We ask it in your name. Amen. I've started listening to a man on the internet, uh, which can be good and bad, but uh, his name is Dutch Sheets, and he's a retired pastor. And what he has is he has a program every day, and the program is called Give Him 15. Give God 15 minutes of your time today. And I although I end up giving him a lot more than that, I've really enjoyed the things because what this man does is he takes current situations and relates them to the Bible and when it happened in the Bible. And so it's been a lot of fun, especially with what we're going through right now, to listen to his perspective, but more to listen to God's perspective on how and why things are happening. He talked this past week about Uh, the Israelites, when they got to the River Jordan, and they were going to cross over, but Moses said, you know what, I want to send 12 people over, and they're going to scout what's going on over there. Essentially, these 12 were spies for the Israelites, and we're going to check it out, and then I want those 12 to come back. Well, they all came back, and 10 of the 12 said, no, stay away. There are giants in this land. They're huge and, and we have no business going over there, so we're recommending we just stay here. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, we can take these guys. Caleb was so convinced they could take them that he went to Moses and he said, I will go over and I'll take on the biggest giants of all. They live in Hebron. And, and if you'll give me that land when I conquer it, I'll conquer it. Well, unfortunately for Caleb, they wandered in the desert for 45 years after that. They, the last five years were spent in war, but they were, they were, God was trying to weed out the people that had sinned on this journey. So when they got back uh, after those 45 years, Caleb won his battle, and he was given the land in Hebron. This morning I want to talk about Giants, the good and the bad. Good giants would be people that I hold in a special place in my heart. A lot of you are those giants. My wife, my son, my parents, my extended family. These are all people that are giants in my life. I love them, I respect them, but I know they love me. No matter what I do, they love me. And this, to me, makes those people giants in my life. I admired and and really looked up to a couple of singers when I was in college going through uh, uh, in a music degree. Jussi Beerling, a Swedish tenor. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. Man, I worshipped the ground that giant walked on. Leontine Price, a black soprano, a dramatic soprano, was the same way to me. I just worshipped the ground she, she walked on. What a voice she had. Billy Graham was a giant and still continues to be a giant in my life. I remember the first president that I really studied, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was a giant. He not only basically won the war, but he came back and was president of the United States. John Kennedy, another giant. Uh, short-lived, but I can't imagine the, the things that that man could have done had he remained in office. I admire very much what Donald Trump has done in the last four. I should have prefaced all of this by saying that these are my personal opinions. They don't have to be yours. And up until recently, those were respected. It seems like our opinions are opinions are not really respected anymore, but that's another day, okay? I've had plenty of bad giants in my life. I should say people that I thought were good giants, who, as it turns out, were bad giants because I allowed them to become that way. I did that. For some reason, until recently, this past week, 
I have allowed some of these bad giants to have more of an impact on me and my life than many, many of the good ones. Here I am, having lived most of my life. You know, I, it's not much fun to look at, but it's true. And um, these bad giants have had more of an impact on me and my life than many, many of the good giants. I, have, uh, I was allowing them to control how I dealt with my life and the people in it. Very sad for me, but true. You see, now that I'm on the, what I will call the final approach to heaven, I found out that over the past several years, I had allowed one particular person to have way too much power over my life. What's even more frustrating is that I allowed him to do this. I made the decision to give him the power. I could have made the, a, a much different position, but for some reason, I gave him permission to hurt me. I don't think he has ever really realized or even cared about how deeply he hurt me. That hurt became so magnified that I felt all I could do was just keep pushing it down inside. I didn't want to deal with it. It was so painful. So I just kept pushing it down. By doing that, I had almost come to a place where I had stopped loving myself. That's a hard reality when you get there. You see, I know that our Heavenly Father loves me more than I can possibly imagine. I know that my wife and son love me deeply. Praise God. I know that my parents and family, as well as my extended family, love me. No matter what I do, they love me. That's agape love. That's the definition of agape love. Has anyone here ever been hurt by someone you love? No show of hands, just think about it for a minute. By someone you love. By someone you respect. Has any believer here ever been disillusioned about the church because you were let down by a leader in a church. Maybe there is a person here who is not in a working position anymore because somebody over that position let them go. That happens often. I know for a fact that many times when visiting someone in their home or, or in an assisted care, I hear about these hurts. I hear about them. You see, I chose a profession out of college <laughs> that depended on people loving me and my voice. I was a professional singer. I sang opera and I sang with orchestras. And if the person that came in and did a review on me of that concert didn't like me, I wasn't invited back. If that person gave me a good review, I was probably invited back to do another concert sometime. The problem was, I let people who didn't love me have too much influence over me at that point in my life. They wanted my job. They were jealous of what I was doing. So behind my back, I was constantly getting darts. And I just got tired of it. I thought to myself, I want to go back to Kansas where it's warm and toasty and, and everybody loves me. I don't want to deal with that kind of garbage in my life. One second leads to one mistake. One firing of the dart in the midst of the war that I was going through. The same with the person that I have finally gotten rid of in my life just this past week. The dart cannot come back. The weapon is now headed for you. 
and the one who fired it is typically on your side, so they say. It is war, ladies and gentlemen. It is war. Hit right in the heart. And this is not a Baghdad. This is not a Battle of the Bulge or, or even a pork chop hill. I'm speaking of the many walking wounded in the body of Christ who have been hurt by other believers and non-believers. People who have been hit by the betrayal of a believer or non-believer. Do you know anyone like that? Or is that your story? Are you the victim of a wound inflicted by someone you love? A victim. It does not have to be that way. I would characterize this message that I'm giving you today as a pastoral sermon. I am graciously blessed with the title of pastoral care here in our church. I visit a lot of you. I talk to a lot of you on the phone. Um, and my job is to listen. And I hear these pains, these, these scars over and over. I've heard them from a lot of you right here. I see this as a universal need in the lives of Christians. And I must say in the lives of non-Christians. It is a matter of being hurt by one you love. It is the matter of seeing yourself as a victim or not. In that process, let me tell you how God brought this to me, and then I want to address it from God's word. I was confronted this past week by someone I respect who challenged my calling. Matter of fact, that person said, I don't believe you were called. It hurt. It hurt deeply because it had happened before from another person. I, I went on the defensive. That brought up the old wound the dart was aimed and shot, and I let my shield down. I dropped it for just a second out of anger. Then God intervened. A prayer time with these people. And a prayer time for me to say, Father God, I am sick and tired of walking around with this. I don't want to do it anymore. Then something came to me. You know the prayer we pray every week together? The Lord's Prayer? You remember the part in there? If you First of all, I encourage you all to take that prayer and tear it apart. Phrase by phrase. It's an amazing prayer. Why wouldn't it be? Who put it in motion? But the part that got to me this week was, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. There is the catch. Do we really forgive those people who hurt us? Because if we don't, ladies and gentlemen, it's a sin. It's a sin. You have to pray for those people when they hurt you. You have to confront them when they hurt you and say, you have a right to your opinion, but I have mine also, and I listen to God. Probably because I wasn't ready to listen until this past week, I've carried that wound around. You see, it's a timing issue. I think if God would have come into my life at any other point in time and said, you know, Michael, you really need to deal with this, I wouldn't have been ready. So, 
the patient God that we know he is, he waited for the right time. And then he went tap, tap, tap on my bald head. It was an amazing time. I had prayed for forgiveness and God gave it to me that day. I was released from that hurt that I have bottled up inside for years. I would like to ask myself, why did you waste so much time? Why didn't you do it years ago? I wasn't ready to listen. That's God's timing, right? We have to do it. We have to know it's coming when God taps on us. I want to give you a short list. I went through a whole bunch of things on the internet and I dwindled it down to 10 things that seem to hurt people the most. Here they are. Someone has made you feel like you don't fit in anywhere. It hurts. You may gain some enemies over a choice you make that is best for your family, but it goes against somebody else's grain, so they make trouble for you. It hurts. A friend may get offended by something you unknowingly said or did and refuses to talk to you anymore. It hurts. You may not be able to reconcile your differences with someone you genuinely love. It hurts. You may come to realize a friendship was only about what you could offer them. It hurts. You may feel unaccepted, prejudged, or criticized unfairly by someone you truly wish was your friend. It hurts. Your neighbor suddenly turns their back on you and they may never fully tell you why, which doesn't let you understand why. It hurts. You lost your job that you really thought you'd be in for the rest of your life. It hurts. And finally, the one that rings true for almost everyone in here. Someone you loved commits suicide. That is a horrible, hurtful thing. I have done services for people who have committed suicide. And I always try to give the people left behind encouragement because we don't know what the final thought of that person was before they passed. The person who is hurt and not moving on to embrace that pain as a means for God to do something in his life is the person who is stuck and the clock has stopped. The reason is that he is not denying himself. In fact, the very thing he wants to do is feed himself. He says things like, it's my right. They hurt me. They should do this. They said this about me. I need to be justified. I need to be taken care of. I was offended. But Jesus says, take up your cross Follow me. Deny yourself. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I can tell you that because of what happened to me this past week, I have finally found peace with something I have struggled with horribly for years. An intervention on Michael. And it worked because of God's timing. When you think all the time about how other people hurt you, you cannot have true joy in your life. You basically allow those people to steal your joy. Years ago, I heard in a sermon, don't be bad fruit. 
I, I really like that. Except when my wife uses it against me, of course. <laughs> Michael, that's bad fruit. It's true, though. It's true. When you do that, you've allowed that person to steal your joy. You need, instead, to focus on God's opinion of you. Not anyone else. You can respect what, what those loved ones say to you, but you have to be the one to figure out, is it right for me or wrong? If you focus on the judgments and opinions of people instead of God's purposes and the calling on your life, listen to me, please. Your witness as a Christian can suffer terribly. People know. People sense you're hurt. And they're going to say, why, why should I believe him? He can't even deal with his own problems. He's trying to tell me how to deal with mine. I don't want you for one moment to think this is easy. It's not. This past week was one of the hardest things I've ever been through. It wasn't fun at all until it was over. And I had such a feeling of peace in my heart. When you go through these things, it's like someone reaches in and rips your heart out. It hurts so bad. It's taken me 73 years to figure this out. Thank God I found it. I had to begin be at the right place at the right time. Before this past week, I wouldn't have realized the sin I was committing. I didn't even think about it. I had never thought about the fact that I was allowing this person who spoke into my life to have such an impact on me that I stopped listening to God. That's a sin. It's something I'm going to be held accountable for. I was listening to what people thought of me instead of God. I wonder how many here today are living their lives with the clock stopped. How do you move from being hurt to rejoicing? Well, if you will all be so kind as to get your Bibles ready, we're going to take a little walk through them. Let's look at what the Word says. I want you to turn to the book of Matthew first. And we're going to look at chapter 7. Matthew 7. And we're going to look at verses 15 through 23. Here's what it says. And keep remembering we're talking about being hurt and allowing that hurt to go on. 15, chapter 7. Beware of the false prophets. Wow who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree Produce good fruit. Do you ever wonder if Jesus wonders if we're getting the point? He keeps saying it over in different ways. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And listen to what he says. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
You see, not all who say they are Christians truly have a God-honoring heart. Not all Christians are true followers of Christ and study God's word. Unfortunately, they may not even be saved. We've had people right here in our little church that have questioned their own salvation. You should know when that happened, people. When you were saved, when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you should remember that day. I talk to so many people who go, well, I know it happened. I, I just don't remember when. Well, let's get on it then. Let's do it now. You can't expect people to treat you kindly. It's just not possible without God's power in them. So, don't be surprised when they do or say hurtful things. Here's a phrase I still don't like. Try not to take it personally. <laughs> wow. That's a stretch for me, ladies and gentlemen. That's the first thing we do. We take it personally. We don't stop for a moment and say, God, are you talking to me? Are you saying this to me? I need to discern that, God. Help me. Help me. We allow them to hurt us by expecting what they say or do to us. That's the sin. We need to listen to God. Christians still make mistakes. Can you believe it? Everybody say amen. amen. Because we do. We make mistakes. There's no point in judging the mistakes or sins of others if they've hurt you. You don't truly know where their heart stands with God for eternity. Turn back a little bit farther in the New Testament to Philippians. And we're looking at chapter 4 in Philippians. And we're looking at verses 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. There's the promise. There's the promise. We do hurtful things sometimes, and we all sin equally in the eyes of God. Remember to give people the grace you yourself need to receive. Forgive them even if they don't ask for it. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. We know our salvation, but do they truly know theirs? It's so important that we forgive them and pray for them. Whether they accept it or not is not the point. The point is we are being told we have to pray for them and forgive them for what they did. Dwelling on it only hurts us and makes us miserable, lengthening our own suffering and pain. My mother told me years ago, she said, Michael, you got to give this up and move on. It's really blocking you. It was great advice. I didn't listen, but it was great advice. Forgive and forget. With or without them, and move on in hope and peace that God gives you to keep your head up and smile. If you did something to bring on the hurt, Ask for forgiveness. If you are innocent, pray for the person who tried to get you to believe the wrong. Pray for them. Hard, because a lot of times we're angry. Turn to the book of Romans. And we are looking at Romans 8. And we're looking at verses 
35 through 39, Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Remember, please, we're talking about someone that hurt us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. You see, these verses also help us to see yourself. They help you to see yourself as God sees you. We are told in the Bible that he made us what? Perfect. He made us perfect. He loves you in spite of everything and sees you as his beloved. Nothing, ladies and gentlemen, nothing can take that away. Do you believe you are perfect? Do you believe he loves you no matter what? If you answered no to either one of those questions, I believe you have a problem with your faith. Look at Ephesians 1. Turn back a little bit farther in Ephesians, and we're looking at chapter 1, two verses, 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him before, listen to this, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Did you hear what it said? He chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. And it happened when? Before the earth was formed. That's a few years ago. Beats the heck out of my 73. Paul is telling us that God chose every person who would believe in him before he created them. Paul also notes the importance of the fact that God chose us to be his children. Because of God's wisdom, power, and love as his children, we need to live in obedience to him, not to someone that wants to hurt us. We are to be holy, and that means set aside. Holy. We are also to live in a way which is without blame an important characteristic for all believers. We are part of the one new man in Christ. You become new. When you're born again, you become new. This was not an afterthought to his perfect plan for us. God knew from the beginning the choices each one of us would make, and so he chose us in Christ before the creation of the world, and blessed us in him with every spiritual blessing. Wow. That's exciting. That's exciting. God, before you were born, knew the choices you would have to make. As a believer, God knows you have two choices. You can choose to live a holy life with him, or you can choose to go against the Father's will. The first will result in a fruitful life, which we read about. The second will result in a life of lost opportunities. Paul pleads with us to live a life that is holy and acceptable to God. And the last one, turn a little bit farther back to Titus. 
and we are looking at chapter 2, verses 13, 14, and 15. Titus 2, verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Every second of every minute of your life, he is trying to purify you. He's trying to work with you. Since we are God's children, we long for a relationship many times with other Christians. We need a close family of other believers, people who honor God by being kind and showing grace to others. People who crave godly, genuine relationships. You see, it's part of our nature. Because we are His, so... Yes, if we allow it, it does cut deep when other Christians hurt us. It hurts when we hear that someone who doesn't really know us says something hurtful against us. When this happens, we must forgive and forget and do our part to bring about the kingdom here on earth. Loving loving on those few and true friendships and not wavering in our faith and witness to others because of the hurtfulness of a few. Have you discovered that as you get older, you have fewer really good friends? I remember in high school, I was surrounded by friends. I didn't know what a friend was, but there were lots of people I dealt with. I was in a drum and bugle corps of almost 200 people. They were all my friends. As I've gotten older, I have few, but they're more powerful in my life than any of those 200 were ever. That's a good thing, I'm saying. One day, real soon, we will get to see that place of perfect glory and he's prepared it for you and I, in which there is no hurtfulness. I've heard people say, boy, I can't wait to get to heaven. God and I are going to have a little talk. No, you won't. <laughs> You're not even going to care. You're going to be so happy and dancing and singing. Yes, you'll all be singing. You have to pick the choir you're in up there. The message, the message I'm hoping to leave you with here today is that you are called to take up your cross in every way of your life, including our relationships. It is true that you may be hurt, but you are a disciple of one who was betrayed, who was hurt, and you are no better than Jesus. To follow Christ is to embrace the cross. Hebrews 5 verse 8 says, Though he was a son, he learned obedience through suffering. You know, we're not gluttons for punishment. We're not masochistic and desire pain. I hope we're not. We are followers of Christ, and to identify with Christ... We bring all of our hurts to him. We find meaning in our suffering, even in our betrayals through Christ. In dealing with the experience of being hurt by others, to take up the cross is to stop being a victim and begin to be a victor in the name of Jesus. He will transform you. You who have been hurt and wounded and abandoned and sinned against and betrayed from a victim to a victor by trusting in that one person. You know, he went through all of those things. He was hurt. He was wounded. He was abandoned. He was sinned against. He was betrayed. He was spit upon. 
He was cursed at. Do you think you're better than Jesus? No way. No way. Jesus Christ has transformed the cross from an instrument of destruction sent by the Father to an instrument of salvation ordained by God. You see, in him there can be no more victims, only victors. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words this morning. Thank you for the hearts that you have touched here today. Hurt can be a deep, deep wound. And right now, Father, right now, I pray over this congregation of people that are here in person and the people that are out there on that internet. Let those hurts disappear. Let them ask for forgiveness. Let them give forgiveness. It's what we're asked to do. And the bottom line is, it's so much easier to do than to walk around with the wound festering. Everyone here has at least three or four of those hurts we walked through earlier this morning. Lord, help them right now, in this moment, to ask for forgiveness. Everyone in this room has probably hurt somebody somewhere along the line. Lord, right now, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, cast those things out. Let us feel that peace. That peace that passes all understanding. You give us that peace. We have to take it in. We can't pray for you to take something from us, Lord, and then a day or two or an hour or two later go, you know what, God, I want that back just for a little while. I want to be miserable just for a little while longer. We, of course, don't think that, but too many times we take it back. Help us to leave it. To forgive and forget. Those three words should live in our heart from this day forward, if they're not already there. I thank you for this group of people who have come together this morning to hear your word. Go with them this week. Help them to conquer these hurts. In your name we pray, and in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't take a hand. Just reach across like you would like to. And if you want to with that person, that's fine. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory. Help us to live more fruitful for you, Father God. That we wouldn't hurt anybody. That you would touch our tongue when it's about to spit something out. And that you would touch our heart when somebody wants to do that to us. Thank you for this time together, for your presence here, and we go now, blessed by your word and your son, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in grace. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, you guys.
thank you for watching the video from The Church at Fort Collins. If you are interested in our church or would like to watch our service live online at 10.30 on Sunday morning, please email us at thechurchatfortcollins1 at gmail.com. The number one is a one and it is not spelled out. The church at Fort Collins one at gmail.com. God bless you. Have a beautiful day.